Good morning and welcome to the Illinois Soybean Association's Agribusiness Management Summer Webinar Series. I'm Jesse Schutman, Field Staff Accountant for Illinois FBFM, which is Illinois Farm Business Farm Management, and one of the AMP advisors for ISA. AMP is a new program for ISA, which is in its first year of creation. It's an educational resource for farmers and ag professionals to hear the latest agribusiness advice and guidance. This morning, we are kicking off the AMP Summer Webinar Series with a presentation called Difference Makers, How to Run the Farm Like a Business. But first, I wanna just go through a couple of housekeeping items to review um, for all of you and help make this virtual experience the best possible. You can ask questions of the presenters or ISA webinar staff using the GoToWebinar dashboard on the right side of your screen. If you're having any technical or audio difficulties, please alert the staff through that dashboard as well. Before I introduce the speakers today, I'd like to turn this over to Linda Cole, who is the Director of Ag Innovations for the Illinois Soybean Association for a few comments. So good morning, Jesse and everyone uh, on the webinar this morning. Uh, we welcome you to the 2020 Virtual AMP Webinar Summer Series. We're excited that you could join us, especially from the comfort of your own homes and offices. My name is Linda Call, and I'm the Director of ISA uh, of Innovations at, with the Illinois uh, Soybean Association. And it's my pleasure to share a few words on, half, on behalf of the Illinois Soybean Association today. This webinar series is the inaugural year and the inaugural event for the ISA AMP program, an agribusiness management education platform paid for by soybean checkoff dollars. While we had originally intended an in-person meeting for this summer to see all of you, we're adapting and making the best of this challenging year. So glad you could join the webinar format. What we have this summer with the AMP webinar series is a free five-week lineup of exciting topics. We brought in experts on agribusiness management topics, including succession planning, grain marketing, and much more. And you can tune into just a few sessions, or you can join all of them. <clears throat> our hope is that our soybean farmers and the ag business professionals can use AMP as a go-to resource for advice and guidance. Through AMP, we hope that farmers and farm families find that peace of mind in every decision that you make. You find endurance in running your operations and a legacy in the ability to see your farming operations through the next generations. And we believe that farmers are leaders both for their family operations and the agricultural industry. And AMP webinars deliver information that's needed for today, for this season, and for farming operations for years to come. And that we feel is checkoff money well spent. We encourage you to stay tuned to future AMP program offerings and communications by checking us online at illsoyadvisor.com. So speaking of illsoyadvisor.com, I hope that many of you are making use of this year round agronomic source for, for farmers and agronomists and CCAs and our stakeholders. Here you can find information on upcoming events and webinars and useful information to boost your soybean production needs. So for this webinar series, we ask that you please take a few minutes to complete the post online event survey. It'll only take a little bit of your time. Check for the link in your email and we use your feedback to help make improvements. So we encourage you uh, to help us in doing so. So this AMP webinar series was made possible through the generous support of the Illinois Soybean Checkoff Program and our AMP partnership with Farm Business Farm Management and the University of Illinois Farm Doc team. So we thank you for your support. And we're also proud of the AMP webinar series sponsors, including Farmer Mac, Compeer, and Country Financial. And for today's webinar, we especially like to thank Compeer. We simply could not do all that we do without industry support, our fabulous ag industry. So we, we hats off and we, we, we salute this support. Thank you. So in, clos clo in closing for today, we're here to learn. We're here to learn how to become better farm managers, how to set up our operations for generational success and learn new ways to run our farms like the great businesses they are. So listen, take notes, and most importantly, please ask questions. We'll all probably find a few new ideas that we can implement on our farm and in our farm business management today. Thank you for joining us. We're glad to have you. We hope you walk away with lots of useful information and ideas for your operation. 
And thank you for supporting AMP and we look forward to working with you more in the future. So Jesse, thank you. And we're excited about the webinar series today. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate those comments. Uh, the Soybeans Checkoff support of this program along with our partners is invaluable to its success. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Jackson Takish and Zach Carpenter. Jackson is the chief economic, or excuse me, the chief economist and head of strategy, research, and analytics for Farmer Mac, and he's a Kentucky native. He joined the Farmer Mac team in 2005 and has experience in strategy, research, credit, and underwriting. Jackson earned his MBA from the Indiana University Kelly School of Business and has a master's degree in agricultural economics from Purdue University. Zach leads the vision, development, and go-to-market strategy for the Farmer Mac brand and is the executive vice president and chief business officer. Zach holds an MBA with specializations in corporate finance, accounting, and business law from the Stern School of Business at New York University. Jackson and Zach, I will hand the screen back over to you. Well, uh, thank you, Jesse, so much for the, the great introduction there. And uh, excited to be here. Welcome to the kickoff of the Ilsoy uh, AMP program. Couldn't be happier to be with you digitally. I mean, I know uh, we plan to be in, in person. I wish we could be. But hey, and we're sharing information, we're sharing our experience, and we can do that through the internet, we can do that uh, through the radio, we can do that any number of ways. So I think this is a great uh, medium for us to share some of our experiences and our thoughts uh, uh, and, and, and what we see as difference makers. So what we want to talk to you today, after seeing thousands uh, upon thousands of credit applications, of farm financials, of uh, balance sheets, income statements, all those things, what are the things that uh, are common threads? I mean, every farm is different. They have different sizes, different specializations. Um, you know, we've seen, seen them all as they come through our shop. Uh, but what are the common threads that really define uh, uh, successful businesses versus ones uh, that may struggle at times? And so what we've done here, um, you know, is use our experience to try to, to thread some of those needles. Now, I, as a chief economist, I've had a lot of roles at Farmer Mac. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about how my experience uh, will hopefully be beneficial to you guys here. I've studied all sorts of different uh, uh, commodities, all sorts of different uh, uh, you know, agricultural economic environments, and, and that's, that's the lens I come at this from, more of a 30,000-foot view, uh, looking at how all the markets interplay with uh, farm financials and farm businesses. I've also spent a lot of time at Farmer Mac in our underwriting and credit functions and doing risk management through our portfolio risk. So I have got that whole portfolio view. Now I want to ask Zach if you if you want to come in here and tell a little bit about your background because it's really extensive and really cool uh, in how many different operations you have uh, reviewed and, and helped finance over the years. But also maybe talk a little bit about Farmer Max. So Zach, I'll turn it over to you for just a few minutes to give that uh, sort of make that connection. Great, thanks, Jackson, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Zach Carpenter. I'm very excited to be here with you virtually today. Um, I am the Chief Business Officer at Farmer Mac, uh, overseeing our Farm and Ranch, USDA, uh, institutional and commercial agricultural lines of business. I've been with the organization a little over a year. Um, it's been a great year, uh, a crazy year, as, as everyone knows. Um, but prior to my time at Farmer Mac, I spent about a decade at Cobank, um, the largest uh, institution in the farm credit system, um, you know, serving in various roles, um, starting with credit underwriting, uh, lending, structuring, and, and syndicating financial transactions. And it, what I really loved about that opportunity was working with, um, you know, producers in our rural um, agribusiness banking group, all the way up to large corporate agribusinesses in terms of helping them succeed, helping them structure financings, um, and really trying to be a financial advisor for them. Um, so it was a great, it was a great time, and, and it's very exciting to take my experience at CoBank and transition over to Farmer Mac and, and work with Jackson and and all our colleagues um, on the team to really uh, enhance the brand and enhance Farmer Mac in, in terms of who we are. And so um, the, the question is, who, who are we? Um, you know, we're Farmer Mac, and just to talk, provide a brief overview of our company, um, we were created in 1988 as part of the farm credit system, really to serve as a, as a vital access to credit and a secondary capital capacity um, for farmers and ranchers and sellers across the, the ag and rural communities. We are a mission-based organization, um, so we're really committed to help build a strong and vital rural America and agricultural presence by increasing the availability and affordability of credit um, across the value chain. Um, you know, we want to be there long-term, we want to be consistent, and we want to be reliable. 
Um, and so our goal is to be that organization that can provide those, um, those components um, throughout the ag and rural community landscape. Um, our customers represent a broad spectrum of the agricultural community from agricultural lenders, agribusinesses, institutional counterparties, and other institutions that can benefit from our flexible um, and reliable uh, financing and risk management tools. Um, overall, we're about 21 billion in assets. Um, over 16 billion is related to the agriculture and agribusiness financing sectors across numerous business lines and, and products. Um, you know, so as we begin a discussion today, I think it's important to get a sense of why Jackson and I are here um, covering this topic of you know, how to run a farm like a business. You know, as Jackson set up, you know, we, we bring a diverse set of experiences here today. You know, we value being experts in finance, structuring, and lending, as well as being able to incorporate macro and micro research, analytics, and strategy to facilitate being more of what I call a financial advisor um, versus just a transactional lender to our customers. Um, we've been able to work alongside local ag producers up through local, regional, national cooperatives, family owned and operated businesses up through large national agribusiness entities, um, covering loans of all sizes from many different commodities and regions. Uh, between the two of us, we've seen quite a bit. Um, and so we're excited to share some of the experiences that we've seen across our journey um, with you. And, and we feel this diversified experience really helps broaden our skill set um, so that we are better able to facilitate. Um, with our customers and develop a financing experience that meets every single one of our, our institutions we work alongside with. Jackson? A, a, a perfect overview of uh, that diverse experience, which I think lends itself uh, well to, to talking about that, uh, that common thread across all these different businesses that we've taken a look at. We are experts in that field of finance. We, we know a lot about agriculture. But you, you are not going to be able to quiz us on the agronomy of uh, soybean growing or uh, hog producing, or you guys are the experts in that field. But we can help you uh, uh, with uh, business organization, with concepts, with strategy, all those kind of things. So that's really what we're trying to get at today. And you're gonna, we're going to set up the conversation through talking about these common thread concepts uh, that, that stitch together those successful farm businesses. And it's really, you're going to hear that all week. Uh, and oh, throughout the next two weeks, as you as you uh, connect with other AMP presenters, uh, you're going to hear a lot of these common concepts come up, and, and you'll be able to dig more into them throughout. Um, so what you'll find that what you hear today, you're going to hear more and more of uh, throughout the entire AMP program, which I think is a really powerful way to reinforce uh, some of those ideas and threads. And of course, at the end, if we've timed this right, we've got plenty of time for Q&A. So make sure you've got your pens and pencils handy, or if you're like me, these days I don't even have a pen and pencil, I've got my notepad up uh, on the computer. Just jot down your questions as we go, and uh, Jesse will help us with a Q&A session towards the end of the program, and we can answer anything that you want to know from, uh, you know, what kind of crazy business my kids are getting into upstairs, uh, to uh, what are great ways to communicate with your lender and have that constant point, touch point of communication, all, everything in between, uh, we're happy to answer. Uh, so why don't we hit our first concept? We'll jump right in, Zach, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back to you to talk about discipline because I think this is one of the most important concepts that I have experienced in my uh, dealings with farm businesses, and I know you have as well. Absolutely. Th thanks, Jackson. Um, so our first concept is uh, discipline maketh the business. Um, it seems really silly to say out loud, but you must be a disciplined business. And, and let's discuss a little bit about what and where we mean by being a disciplined business. You know, first off, discipline is at the holistic level, you know, covering much more than just execution at the operating and production level. You know, as you can see in this triangle on the left, good businesses focus predominantly on execution. And, you know, the horizontal bar on the bottom, it, it time spent focuses on, you know, the amount of time on, on these four main um, operations that we feel are impactful to, to any sort of business. Um, you know, many companies and customers we have worked with believe pure production discipline and execution should garner the most focus. Um, clearly, it's important. We're not trying to, to minimize that, but business discipline should cover much more than just production and operating effectiveness. You know, becoming a disciplined business starts much earlier in the process um, and requires investing in time in appropriate areas. This is where we believe a little bit of book theory is crucial uh, for success. You know, as we can see in this next triangle, it's essentially flipped. Um, um, and, and really what the focus is on here starts with the analytical portion of, of, of a business. You know, first assessing your business in terms of both internal and external um, analyses. You know, think of like a strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threat assessments, but heavily focused on some of these more external 
um, items in the market that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, it really provides a foundation on how you feel your business can navigate through those environments. Um, this provides the assessment or evaluation of your organization or your company, looking at both things in your control, but more importantly, out of your control. Um, and how should you be updated? How can you assess and navigate those markets um, by looking at some of those analytics or, or some of those scenarios that, that may come up? Um, this is something that should be updated annually. Um, it doesn't need to go into um, as much detail annually, but it's something you need to rec um, reflect upon on an annual basis to see what's changed and how you need to need to adjust going forward. Um, it provides an identification of avenues and where you have been and the adaptiveness and nimbleness you might need to, to maneuver within those markets. Um, it means you've thought through the strategies to help navigate the, um, the external um, environments that will impact your business. So once this foundational assessment of your business is complete, you know, then the key pieces um, and the focus on is the foundation reflect the strategic vision or, or the strategy, sec strategy section of this triangle. Um, where has your business been? Where is it going? How are you going to get there? It, it's a way for you to chart the path. Um, this is where you determine and confront the issues head on. You ask your difficult questions about your business. Is there a generational transition to take place? What does that look like? What are your growth objectives? Are they necessary and appropriate for your business? Are they realistic. Um, strategic vision typically spans a two to five year horizon. It's much more high level than an annual budget. Um, you know, think of an analogy here, like, you know, the strategic vision is like a drafting strategy of a football team and determining your starting lineup where your annual budget is more like the individual game plans for, for every game you go into. So, you know, this strategy portion of it is really mapping out the vision of where you see your um, organization going over medium-term horizon. You know, after you've analyzed who you are and where you're going, it's really time to focus on preparation. Get the right people, keep them on board and make the tough decisions, um, which I know Jackson's gonna talk about a little bit later. Identify the infrastructure and the resources needed, technology, support, equipment. Um, deal with the right counterparties from you know, the input side to the customer side, working with a bank, you know, relationships are especially key um, as you think through your strategic vision, you know, ones that you know, ones that you're comfortable with, but more importantly, ones that you can rely upon and are consistently there in good times and bad. You know, this is where also you focus on a financial um, projection model. Prepare appropriate financial records. In many instances, it might not just be tax returns. You might have to elevate more to financial statements um, to really get kind of the platform um, and the foundation you need to get to the next level. Um, this brings the strategic vision to numbers. Uh, it helps more with the bank and working with the yield, price, and cost assessment in terms of if you were trying to layer on some leverage or debt. Um, and it's a time where you really need to be realistic given the environment um, that you're working through. And lastly, execution. Um, with, the, with the three components in place, analysis, strategy, and preparation, you know, execution kind of falls out. It, it, it's, it's a time for you to be efficient, be effective and execute in line with the three components you just talked about. You know, one point I'd like to just comment on here is pertaining to execution is it's not always tried to, you know, as we all know, it's probably not always best to try and time the peak of the market. Um, we often see producers who try and time the peak, but also miss out and sell at a lower price to generate cash flow. So again, focus on appropriate execution um, of your operation capabilities. So, so these four components provide a foundation um, of a disciplined business, but more importantly, a sustainable business and a future-focused enterprise. The foundation allows you to operate effectively, even in an environment of uncertainty, just like the environment we've been in for 18 months now. Um, be adaptable depending on the market and to focus on the strategic decisions versus the emotional decisions of a great enterprise. So at this point, Jackson, why don't we jump into our first uh, poll question? Yeah, I love this, uh, this question because I think about this all, all the time myself. In what stage of your annual business cycle do you spend most of your time? So you think about our four uh, uh, key operational components there, analysis, strategy, preparation, and execution. Where do you guys spend most of your time? I'm curious to see um, uh, what, you, what you guys have to say there and see where we see most of our time uh, being spent. Uh, for me, it's certainly uh, probably more in preparing and doing than, uh, than I see here in this inverted triangle. So 
I look at this as a way to not just as a farming business, but as any business, uh, to sort of reprioritize some of my activities in, in uh, at my job at Farmer Mac. Uh, maybe a question while we're waiting for the results to tally up, uh, Zach. Uh, this discipline, do you see do you see it beneficial in terms of you know approval process or you know probability of getting that loan approved if you're coming in uh, to the bank or to a farm credit association? Uh, is having that discipline shorten the, the timeline to get a loan or increase your probability of getting that loan? Absolutely, and, and a great question, Jackson. Um, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of sections, but having that discipline focus across those four areas really gives a lending institution comfort, um, you know, that you have the, you've put the time and effort into knowing what your business is and knowing where you're going. So it absolutely um, shortens the time and increases the probability of getting approval. And, and what we find is the linkage between the strategic vision up through the financial assessment, up through the execution, is very aligned, which makes really the decision and the discussion internally from a credit standpoint much easier than, you know, if we're trying to balance um, some volatility or some areas that haven't really been thought out um, in terms of those four components we just talked about. Yeah. Uh, and, and even if you're not a producer, you're, you're tuning in, you're maybe a farm business manager, consultant, or even lender yourself. These are great questions to think about your own business and your time, uh, but also to ask your customers and your borrowers uh, how they spend their time. So I think it, it applies not even to just the producing side and the farm business side, but also uh, your businesses who might be uh, supporting farm businesses. All right. So let's take a look here. What stage? Uh, I see. Uh, just as we suspect, it's kind of like our... Uh, inverted triangle the wrong way, we have a lot of work doing, right? Let me just make that a little bigger for myself here. And interestingly enough though, Jackson, about a, a quarter really focuses on strategizing the direction of the business. So um, that's great. Again, focusing on the second upside down trial that we that we talked about. But um, yeah, interesting, interesting uh, poll outcome that we got in the first question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's great that we do see so much of the uh, uh, number one and number two, analyzing and strategizing. I think that is great, a uh, great start. And then you can always build on that as you go. Uh, each year can be more and more because it's not something you can just change. If you were spending most of your time in execution before, you can't just flip and all of a sudden yeah. uh, be a strategist, right? So there's a, it's, a, it's a gradual process to get from one triangle to the other. Well, let's jump into our second concept. I'll take this one because it's a little bit uh, uh, more in my wheelhouse of markets and uh, uh, sort of global economic change. But grow what you know, but know what to grow. So this, I, you know, I, I think it's so important to be a specialist and to be an expert in your field. Uh, but you can't just put the blinders on, right? Because things are changing constantly. In fact, one of the uh, biggest things that you can do as a business owner that I've seen people do as business owners is focus on the core strengths. Make sure that they're doing what they could be the best in the world at. Jim Collins has a great book called From Good to Great, and he talks about that a lot. So having those core strengths and being able to focus on the things that you could be the best in the world at is going to allow you and facilitate that success that you want as a leader and as a business uh, executive. But you can't ignore demand. Um, uh, certainly what people are purchasing, how the consumer is behaving. I mean, if 70% if of our economy is driven by consumption, uh, we can't simply just grow our way into demand, right? It's a thing called Say's Law, an economist say, said, hey, you know, supply creates demand. Uh, and I would beg to differ. I think demand really is the thing that drives economic engine, not just of a, uh, um, you know, a business, a bank, or anything like that, but of a farm business as well. Demand is going to be the thing that drives profitability. And then the third thing I think, you know, I say uh, thinking in four dimensions, but the third really thing that you can control is that passion. Uh, so you don't want to just grow things that you're good at and that happen to be in demand. You also want to make sure that you have that drive, that that uh, unspoken passion for the business itself. And that's what's going to allow you to succeed above all others. So when you talk to successful farm businesses, when, I, when I've reviewed those uh, credit packages, you see that in the, the history of the operation. You see that in um, uh, if, you, if I don't get to talk to them directly, which I rarely do. Uh, but when uh, I would you know talk to the lender about how, uh, passionate they were, you would always say, this is my best customer. This is my, he's up every day or she's out in the field every day. And you see that passion come through uh, in that, in that farm business. And what I'll, the concept I'll throw out for you uh, here, just to kind of make it hit at home with the visual is the three things that I just mentioned uh, laid out in a diagram that shows you, you really want to hit the sweet spot in the middle. So production capacity, what are your assets? What do you have specialization in intersected with where is their demand for it? 
Uh, do you have that source of demand? Do you see exports growing? Do you see uh, new uh, sources of demand? So, if, for example, in the United States, we had ethanol come along, right? Really eat up a lot of corn or biodiesel eat up a lot of soy. Um, so do you see that demand growing? Where is it coming from? Is it foreign? Is it domestic? Let's do some analysis around that. Ultimately, you can't make money if you can't sell it. I don't care how good you are at growing soybeans. If people aren't buying soybeans, you're just going to have a lot of soybeans. Uh, and then the last uh, uh, circle that I'll talk about is the passion and drive. What wakes you up in the morning as a business leader, uh, as a farmer, or as a, a farm business, or a supporting farm business? And then the fourth dimension uh, that I want to talk about is time, right? So that's what I mean by four, four Ds. You can be in this sweet spot, uh, and you can, you can exist there for a, quite a few years, uh, maybe even a decade or more, where you've got everything lined up, and you are in the middle of all three triangles or all three circles and you feel like you're on top of the world and you have a very successful business. But what about five years from then? Um, are you going to see all those three things stay in place or all those three uh, uh, components of the sweet spot analysis going to persist and what happens if one of them moves? So in the event you see demand shrink or maybe it slides out and another uh, commodity takes takes pre precedence or takes preference with consumers, how are you going to change your business and set yourself up to realign those other two? Um, and so I think this, this is the one where if you've got uh, great strategic planning and great analysis, you're able to stay on top of this. And I've seen that in uh, really long-term successful farm businesses. They do that uh, a SWOT analysis. They look at the opportunities and threats in the marketplace, and they try to make sure that they're putting themselves in the way of demand. I love that quote from uh, Wayne Gretzky, I don't skate to where the puck uh, is I skate to where it will be, and that's absolutely true of uh, farm finance as well as farm production. So this is the thing that we lo we're looking for, um, you know, in, in lending and in in, in strong financials and all those things that would clue us into a strong uh, farm business. There are people who can identify what am I good at, what am I passionate about, but also am I growing the thing that's going to make me uh, profitable over the next five to ten years, and how am I changing and how am I adaptable to make sure and put myself to where that puck is going to be through time. All right, Zach, I'll pitch it back over to you. I'll keep my uh, hockey analogy alive. I'll uh, just go ahead and pass you the puck. Awesome. So uh, cap is still key. Um, that's, that's still a true statement, but really it's, it's not the whole story. But let's talk about cash flow for a little bit. Why is cash key? Um, what is it about cash flow that's so important? It, it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to, to focus on that for a minute and then broaden and more towards what's the whole story. You know, so first, focusing on net income, revenues, or other financial statement metrics don't provide a simplistic assessment um, or measure of a business's viability like cash flow does. Um, net income is accounting concept. As, as everyone knows, there's um, changes in accounting, there's non-cash components in there, think depreciation, amortization, gains and losses. It really muddies the water in terms of um, a pure financial assessment uh, of an enterprise. Secondly, um, cash is key in terms of providing flexibility. Flexibility to make investments, support expansion, um, enhance resources, get a larger team, um, et cetera. The more cash flow you have, you know, the more expenses or fixed charges you're able to cover. You know, however, cash flow doesn't necessarily mean you need to use it. Um, this is where we bifurcate the emotional decision making versus the strategic decision making, rational versus irrational utilization of cash flow. For example, you know, trying to minimize the tax um, expense through year-end purchases might be, you know, from a personal perspective, a, a good decision, but from a business perspective, might not be the best utilization of cash. Um, Lastly, as businesses, you know, exceed more to that agribusiness level, purchase more acres, become larger, um, increasingly lenders start looking more at cash flow metrics for valuation um, and, and financial assessment. So it continues to be a very larger component of the underwriting assessment, but again, it's not the whole story. So what else is out there? Well, cash is key and is one component of an overall underwriting philosophy that we want to talk through today that lenders rely on to assess the risk of a business. Um, underwriting philosophy as defined is purely looking at the specific components of a business, the risks, to assess if it can lend money to that business. Underwriting philosophy that I've always worked is, is really what we call the five C's of credit, which we've highlighted here on the right side of the screen. Um, starting at the orange circle on the right, it's, it's capital, really the equity in the business. 
um, followed by capacity. And this is where we just talked about cash flow. Cash is key. Um, what is the cash generation um, capacity of the business? Collateral. How valuable is the land securing the loan? What is the LTV of the land securing the loan? Character. Um, management and historical performance. Very important in an underwriting decision. And condition. What's the market environment? How's the business manages the market environment? And where the, in the past and where are they going in the future? So we usually split the underwriting philosophy into two main components. First, the, the qualitative component, or excuse me, the quantitative component. This area reflects the typical financial metrics uh, we use to kind of assess the overall financial health of the business. We generally look historically for the last two or three years in terms of assessing those financial metrics, as well as one year forward. Um, you know, one year projections we feel is more relevant as you get two, three, four years out. Too much uncertainty really to leverage those, but um, maybe a trailing 12 month or one year projection will also incorporate into the assessment. Um, this covers the, the capital, the capacity, and the collateral area of the underwriting philosophy in the lower right hand corner. Um, while specific financial metrics can differ based on sector, um, industry, commodity, region, um, there are fundamental factors that transcend across all financial analysis. And simplistically, it's cash flow, liquidity, and leverage. Um, so cash flow, the cash flow generation, again, of the business, the capacity component of it. Liquidity, working capital. Um, the working capital that you have that converts to cash over time, you know, generally think of like a current ratio or current assets over current liabilities. Um, and leverage. And, and here, simplistically, it would be an LTV assessment. Uh, as a lender, we typically have a baseline of each financial metric that I just that I just talked about that would needed to be achieved to kind of check the box. And if, if that level or that low metric is not achieved, we'd want to look at a mitigating factor or a strength in another area to kind of uh, compensate for that, that metric that wasn't uh, achieved. So here's a good example. Maybe um, given the environment, the cash flow of a business is rather tight versus historical um, standards because of the market. Um, but the owner has mitigated this through lower leverage um, and a higher liquidity component, higher working capital. Um, well, that helps from a lender standpoint because that lender understands that you know cash flow is tight. They set themselves up to weather this um, uncertainty or this downturn. And so these three metrics um, working together really help us make a the right lending decision to see um, holistically if those metrics um, make sense. Second is the qualitative component. Um, the business model and strategy, the management experience. It's the character and condition bubbles on the upper left-hand corner of the underwriting philosophy circle. Um, what, has the business, what has been the business's operating history? Are they adaptable in the face of commodity pressure? What is the marketing plan? Do they hedge? How do they take emotions out of the equation? Are the projections and budget realistic based on historical standards or market pricing? Um, have appropriate investments been made? And this is what we want to link back to um, comments we made earlier. We don't necessarily look at producers who make, you know, the most money in one or two years um, as the strongest, but someone who has shown consistent profitability over time by taking advantage of good prices, not the best prices, to service fixed costs, grow their equity and liquidity positions so they can withstand a cyclical downturn. You know, a lender doesn't really get to a yes decision in, in lending money without comfort in both you know, the quantitative and qualitative components of underwriting philosophy. Um, so as we wrap up this concept, keep in mind the importance of cash flow, uh, but understand the overall underwriting philosophy that a lender wants to look at and the components that go into each of these philosophy, and a lot of them link together, um, that help go into a, um, a lending organization making a financial decision. Uh, Jackson, why don't we jump into our next poll question at this time? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so uh, which of those five Cs do you focus on yourself? Now, if you're a farm producer, that's uh, uh, capacity, capital, collateral, character, or conditions. Um, which one of those do you feel like is the most important? And then if you're, if you're a, a supporting farm business manager or you know, a consultant or a agricultural lender, think about that same for, for which one do you feel like is most important for your customers or your borrowers out there on the farm? I'm really curious to see here too, because I think every underwriter has a different flavor as to what they think of as the most important uh, uh, element in their underwrite. Don't you agree, Zach? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, let's just look at Farmer Mac for a second. We're heavily involved in, in long-term real estate, you know, financings, right? So, you know, a, a big component of our underwriting assessment historically has been collateral, right? The value, the support of the collateral backing the loan. 
um, I think as we've broadened out over time and, and, and really accelerated into lar or actually seen larger and larger farms um, over the last five or 10 years, it's really, really has allowed us to broaden and look at some of these other components really to make the right lending decision. And Jackson, you've been here at Farmer Mac for a while. Have you seen kind of that evolution? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, um, while collateral is scrutinized, certainly it's scrutinized. I think cash flow and capacity to handle uh, debts and, and, and capital reinvestment uh, is one of those things that you don't see a whole lot of exceptions for. Uh, so uh, making sure that the cash flow is there, especially coming out of, you know, we were born in the 1980s. Uh, yeah. So that is capacity is one of the big things uh, that we learned that you can't always be a collateral letter in full. Um, you certainly can re rely on collateral as your secondary source of repayment, but you know, you want to make sure that the cash flow is there in the business. But I, I, I would also throw out maybe the six, uh, I'm not going to confuse the poll here. We got five choices, but in my experience, that 60 is uh, communication and how well do you take these five and communicate it out to um, uh, investors, uh, lenders, uh, even just your fa your own family members. How how good can you communicate that? And it comes back to having the discipline and the understanding of the business to be able to communicate all five of these. Absolutely. And then, oh, well, here we go. We got results. Exciting results. Yeah, look at that. That's uh zero percent on collateral uh see that's uh, that's interesting so really focus on the you know, capacity and cash flow uh 42 percent of you said that that was the uh, number one thing you felt like was most important the most uh, of the five c's the most important component but also capital and you know ca hey, character you can't forget about the the narrative and the, and the borrower and that qualitative component that's a great great poll question Thank you all for participating in these. These are uh, hopefully informative to you, but they're also informative to us, uh, which, you know, I, again, thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts and um, uh, perspectives. All right, so our next concept number four, you got to be a tech adopter, but it's got to be the right technology. Um, so as agriculture has evolved over the course of the last hundred years or so, all of that great productivity gains, all the output gains, and I'll show you a chart here in just a second, has really come from uh, better technology, better seed technology, genetics, all that kind of stuff has developed in, in the ag sector and, and allowed us uh, to be the best <laughs> at growing stuff all across the world. Um, but one thing I'll say here about technology and speci specifically is that the only constant in our business, in our economy is that there's change. Uh, and technology allows you to adapt to that change uh, more quickly it allows you to take advantage of those changes and, and improve your efficiencies, and it can happen uh, very rapidly and sometimes with a little investment, sometimes more investment. That's why we have to talk about that right level of technology and the right uh, corner of technology. One thing I think that's a big misperception is that leaders have to be some sort of uh, a tech wizard or they have to understand every component of their uh, of their business, and that's that's you know not entirely true. What you need to understand is how the technology fits in with your business. How does it make it better? How does it better inform? Uh, in the analysis or strategy phase, but also in the execution, how does it make you better from uh, productive capacity? But you don't have to know the ones and zeros. I guarantee you, you know, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, doesn't know how the chips work inside of the iPhone. Maybe he does. I don't know him personally. Maybe he does. Uh, but in general, my experience is that leaders aren't the people who are driving uh, the technology adoption, but they are the ones directing the resources to do that research, to understand the technology, and to better uh, assess what's the right technology for them. So having those dedicated resources, uh, that's where I've seen a lot of successful businesses take it to the next level, is that they don't just try to do it all with one person themselves, trying to be both the executioner, strategist, and technology person. They actually bring in outside help uh, to do that. Now, I mentioned technology being one of the driving forces. You can look at U.S. total farm uh, factor productivity gains by source. Since 1948, we've seen about an average of about 1.5% per year in productivity growth. Uh, in, in the agricultural sector. But since you guys are focused on soybeans, I thought I would just map out oil crops. Uh, and we have seen tremendous gains in the oil crop uh, productive efficiency over the last, so an average of 3.5% per year, you know, more than two times that of farming in general over the last, um, say, 70 years. And if you look at the components of that, you can break that down by labor, capital, uh, technology. Labor and land themselves have been decreasing. So we put in less hours, we put use less land, actually to the tune for labor, 2% decrease per year. Uh, so as we've automated, we're putting in less labor, 
and yet we're still seeing those incredible productivity gains and all that has to do with better technology both from a seed uh, perspective uh, 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 you know tractors capital perspective but also uh, from data um, so why don't we go to one more let's do one more poll yeah so let's do a research poll on, on tech so do you or your company have dedicated time and or resources for researching new technology and innovation uh, yes or no you know I'll, I'll give some color from the the financial um, organization perspective um, for, for many, many years, I think there was complacency in the financial space to really focus on innovation and technology. And I think it's really caught up to us. And, you know, here at Farmer Mac, we've spent a significant amount of time, especially over the last three years, really looking at technology and trying to layer in where technology is going with our strategic plan and what would be the right technology um, and innovation for us to adapt and really trying to have that component of what be, be a key piece for our strategic plan. You know, Jackson, as you've been out there and, and presenting as a, as a chief economist and everything, what, what has been some of the key feedback pieces you've heard from um, the technology and innovation space in the market? Well, it's, it's been wild to watch. I mean, so I came into um, ag finance in 2005, sort of pre-ethanol, uh, pre-farm uh, boom. And, you know, in those days, you go to conferences, you wouldn't hear a lot of vendors talk about uh, uh, data on the farm. You know, big data wasn't even a thing in 2005 when I came into the business. Uh, and so over the next 10 years, because farming became so successful, and I think a lot of people realized just how uh, uh, how many inefficiencies there were in the process throughout, you know, from uh, input generations all the way through uh, to marketing and the, the movement of product. Uh, there's been a lot of investor interest in trying to generate new businesses around that process and find those efficiencies. They've been done in other places, like think of Amazon as an example of a retail and all of the efficiencies that Amazon love them or hate them. They, they built a lot of efficiencies in the process of us buying shoes. Uh, and so I think people looked at agriculture and said, hey, there's a lot of opportunity here. And, you know, probably within 10 years, so think about 2014, 15, I started meeting people from Harvard Business School, uh, uh, big, you know, non, historically non-agricultural schools starting to come out uh, as consultants, uh, starting to start businesses that would look at analysis of data. Um, Farmers Business Network was a, a big one that started a few years back that's uh, grown into, and, you know, the list goes on. I'm going to show you a chart here in the middle, just how complex the ag tech space is, but it really blossomed in the last six, seven years. All right. So we have a poll results here. 63% say yes. You have a dedicated, uh, you've either dedicated your time and resources or you have dedicated time uh, and resources for researching new technology and innovation. I think that is crucial. Um, to uh, finding the right piece. So what's the right place for you? Um, because as I mentioned, the, the landscape is complex. Um, we, we've seen investor interest, not just uh, uh, individuals coming out of school going like, hey, I, I, I think farming is a, is a great industry. I really think it's got a you know, fantastic mission. I like the people I work with. Let me see if I can't find my corner of the agricultural uh, farm tech landscape as the Better Food Ventures calls it. Um, it's, it's all sorts of companies, right? So you've got the Monsantos, the DuPont Dow uh, investment, and people are trying to eat each other up and try to figure out what's the right uh, size, how am I going to get to scale with my data uh, systems. Uh, what this, I love this chart. They update it every year. It's betterfoodventures.com. You can go check it out yourself. It's free to download. And they're constantly reevaluating what is it you're trying to do and who is providing that service. Uh, so this is a great tool to be able to say, oh, hey, if I want to do some farmland analysis, who is really right now uh, innovating in that space? And so Acre Value Tillable, Ag Analytics is a group that we're working with. Uh, there's a lot of uh, really interesting companies out there. Uh, and then you can use this tool to start to, to you know, find some place to start uh, and do some of that background research. Another little tip um, that I'll pass along to you that I myself use as, as Farmer Mac tries to also adopt uh, new uh, processes, new data techniques, all that kind of stuff. I let the salespeople do their work. Um, so it's, it's, good. it's really difficult to try to research all these things and find the right ones. But I guarantee you, uh, if you get a salesperson on the phone, they're going to tell you all about it. They're going to, even if you give them a little bit of your data, uh, they're going to take that and try to work with it and, and show you how it could work for you. And so a lot of that research can be done through the sales, uh, uh, the sales team at each one of these companies. And I found myself being able to weed through 
some of these things and shortcut uh, some of the research that I would have to do just by leveraging the resources that they're putting out to sell me. Uh, so that's one little uh, a nugget of wisdom that I've learned in my, my time, uh, as someone who leads business innovation efforts um, uh, at Farmer Mac, let the sales team help you out. Uh, sometimes you got to say no. That's the hard part is when you finally get to the end of that uh, conversation. You're like, well, thank you. I will not be purchasing your, your good or service. You have to be good at that too. You can't buy everything that the salespeople uh, sell you, but start here and then start doing your research and then let the salespeople help you uh, isolate which is the right choice for you. All right, so I'm going to pitch it back to you, Zach. Send the puck back your way uh, to talk about um, uh, structure. Absolutely. Concept number five, bigger can be better, it can be worse. Uh, you know, over the years in, the, in, in working in the financial services space, especially as it pertains to ag, we've grappled this, with this question with our customers all the time. Um, and, and many of our customers have focused on growth as a, as a top priority. And, and the viewpoint is really to get to the next level means increasing size and scale. Um, you know, customers were focused on acquisitions, expansions, acquiring more anchors. The co concept of being a larger operation really overwhelmed the conversation of the discipline strategic focus um, that we talked about earlier. And that focus and that understanding of who your business, what your business is and where you're going really was secondary. Um, you know, but getting, for, getting bigger for the sake of getting bigger is not always the right answer. Um, and this is where we tie back the discussion of being the disciplined business should we just mention. Um, the determination of size really should be a result of your strategic vision um, you set with your operations. Does that align with where you want to go and how you want to get there? Um, the answer is yes, which it absolutely could be. You know, we're not saying size isn't a, isn't a good thing. Um, did the financial projections and the analysis um, layer and the components need to get to a larger scale? Does it make sense? Is it realistic? Are you able to support that size? Um, there absolutely are benefits to size. Size can give you scale, uh, cost efficiency. This can improve cash flow and profitability, um, potentially more marketing opportunities, new regions, new sectors, um, and also, also could facilitate future growth. All potentially good things, absolutely. However, the strategic vision question is answered and expansion is you know, where you want to go. It's how do you effectuate that? Generally speaking, um, the use of leverage or debt effectuates um, being um, part of that growth strategy. Um, but have you really thought through the ramifications of that? Um, cost of leverage could be impactful. The more leverage you have, the higher interest rate you're generally going to receive. Uh, potentially financial covenants. Um, if you're working with the organization in a bank and, and you want to put a financing package in place, you might have uh, to manage through financial covenants. Uh, lots of equity. You've levered your equity to get to bigger space. And, and ultimately, the potential could have more fixed costs. And, and hopefully, as you get larger, that cash flow generation ability can cover that. Um, but you have to take that into consideration with a larger size. Um, ultimately, this, this could reduce a, um, result in a loss of flexibility. Given the larger size, there are more limitations on what you can do going forward. Um, and these limitations could be imposed by a bank. Um, it could be imposed by a larger fixed cost basis because you have larger size and scale. Um, or it could be imposed by a lack of infrastructure investment to, to support the um, size and scale. So, we like these boats. Uh, we feel they provide a nice example of, of flexibility lost by increasing size and scale. And the cruise ship, um, as you can see, it just takes a, a long time to, to take a turn, right? To, if things need to be adjusted or you need to be nimble and maneuver through a, a volatile environment, a little bit more difficult to manage that. Um, whereas a speedboat can quickly adapt to change. It can change course and direction and modify strategic vision um, fairly quickly. So one is not better than the other. It just requires the understanding of the impacts to your organization and how you can uh, manage through changes in the cyclical environment um, with the business that you, that you have currently. And, and this reminds me of a company I used to work with. So I'll throw another little example out here um, that really specifically dealt with the size and the growth question. Um, the company believed through a single shareholder um, and not through a holistic strategy uh, or vision discussion that the best way to drive shareholder value um, and to increase their share price was to grow. Um, you know, why they believe that um, increasing um, their properties would lead to increased cash flow, which would ultimately increase dividends to the shareholders. And that's how they thought it was going to make value for you know, the organization and, and their shareholders. You know, what happened is this growth was accompanied by excessive leverage um, and needed to acquire these additional properties. 
Um, so if the company more than doubled in size, you know, a couple of things happened. First, the, the, sh the shareholder wanting larger dividends sold. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to be a shareholder and sell a liquid share price and, and get out at the right time. Uh, when you're in company, it's not that easy to maneuver and change your strategy in an interyear basis. Um, second, the increased size of the organization had a much larger expense base um, and infrastructure that it needed to support um, because of the successive growth that, went, that they took on so quickly. Um, and lastly, the use of debt required increased covenants they needed to manage around. So ultimately, they, it was a lack of flexibility and they needed to take a step back, which they did. They reassessed their strategic vision. Um, they determined really what they wanted to be was efficient, operating focused organization versus size. And they began implementing um, from a prepare, preparation standpoint, the right platform to go down to be that efficient organization. And ultimately they sold some properties to reduce debt. They wanted to regain some of that flexibility um, and they realized being a smaller, more nimble organization um, was their best interest to drive value. You know, so sometimes size isn't the primary strategic focus for a business. Um, you know, why does it make sense to remain at the current levels and not pursue growth acquisitions? Well, being smaller, like as we mentioned, increased nimbleness and adaptiveness. It's easier to maneuver should you need to. I mean, look at our current situation um, over the last 12 to 18 months with, with weather, trade, COVID, uh, without leverage and the need to maintain a larger scale, I would say that being nimble in this type of environment and flexible and adaptable are crucial mitigants to the, the you know, market that we're facing today. You know, remaining at the current size also allows you to focus on becoming a more efficient business, a focus on your operations, your execution, your efficiency, and what that could do is really set up your foundation to effectuate growth in the future. Um, and additionally, size makes it just a little bit harder to quickly change your strategy. I mean, these, these boats, the comparison to the cruise ship and the speedboat kind of highlights that, you know, throwing a higher leverage profile and the ability to implement uh, quick strategic changes is, is, is kind of reduced. So as we, as we conclude this concept, really the right investment and growth strategies are in line with your vision we previously discussed. Focus on the right growth. Um, it takes into consideration the underwriting philosophy, what metrics are impacted, um, and how are the potential risks mitigated. Uh, focus on linking strategic opportunities, changes to your financial plan, and identify the impacts to your overall business. Balance scale versus nimbleness, and understand the pros and cons of each, um, being smaller or being larger with larger scale. Um, and as always, work with your financial institution for the appropriate leverage profile, and make sure this leverage profile has been thoroughly vetted in line with your strategic vision and meets your strategic needs. You don't want to get caught up in, you know, an over cumbersome, overcoveted financial package that really doesn't align with where you want to go. So it's very important to work with your relationship organization, the lending organization, to find that right financial package. Why don't we, uh, well, I think that, that over to you, Jackson. Yeah, well, I think that's a perfect segue too, because if you've got the right size, you got to have the right people. So everything we talked about is all about for the organization and, and your process. Uh, and those are all incredibly important to understand your process, your product. But I also think people uh, is an important uh, component of a successful business. Um, great businesses have great teams. You can't do it all a single person. You need to rely on multiple people's uh, skill sets and they have to be engaged. So good businesses have, are going to have that team uh, where people care, people are passionate and they bought into that strategy uh, and are ready to execute at a high level. Now, I see a lot of families involved together in, in farming. I think it's a beautiful aspect of our uh, our industry, um, but it's you know not the only source of, of labor that you have uh, is your family. So you might have to look outside the family uh, to potentially add in some of the skill sets that we talked about, either technology, uh, is it financial, do you need a, a chief financial officer, somebody who's got that background. A lot of times you can build that, uh, inside the organization that you have, but sometimes you have to look outside to get the right people. And if you determine through through your analysis here of looking at the right, getting the right people on board, you have to make that cut quick. Uh, if the, if you've got somebody in there who's not the right fit, uh, either move them to another place, another uh, section of the organization, or find somebody else and encourage them to find something that's going to make them happy. Uh, leaving people in the wrong place is it's harmful to the business, but it's also harmful to the person. Because uh, they're just not going to be as engaged or as passionate about the day-to-day the -day work that they can have uh, in in your business and in, on the farm itself. Now, just to, to to give you an example of what this matters, I mean, 
uh, families to create fixed costs. So if you're trying to, to have distributions every year, say in this uh, example here, we're trying to pay out $45,000 to each family. Uh, what I was able to do is look at the profitability level on uh, soybeans, soybean acre today, and compare that to great times and then not so great times and say, how many acres would you have to have to really sustain that $45,000 distribution uh, to cover living expenses, to cover family expenses? And as you can see, is, uh, in current times, you, you, know, you need something on the order of about 1,000 acres uh, if you have one family, and it's linear, so 2,000, 3,000 if you go up to three families. In great times, which is what we saw in 2012, 2013, you didn't need to have that many acres. We could just pile people on. There's really no difference between uh, a farm with three families and a farm with one family. You could support a lot during the good times. But if you look at lean times when you're earning very little uh, uh, on your, on your uh, turns, right? So it's uh, profitability to earns and turns. If you've got very low profitability, in order to continue to distribute $45,000 in tough times, you need a lot more acres. So talk about size. If you're trying to go from a 500 acre operation to say 25,000 uh, uh, 25, acre operation, that's a huge change. You can't do that uh, overnight. So all this is to say, uh, employees can somewhat be fixed costs. We need to get the right employees in, and the ones that you pick to bring into your organization will have a financial impact on the organization and the type of uh, and size of organization that you can support with your income. So, Zach, why don't you, why don't you just uh, bring us home here? Why don't you bring it all together and give us a little bit of a closing act before we turn it over to folks to grill us on the Q&A. Absolutely. So, you know, as we wrap up here today, we touched on some common thread concepts, um, you know, highlighted on this on this slide that we believe both seen on will help transition a business from a good operation to a great operation. And I think there's some several defining characteristics as you read through some of these concepts um, that we've seen today. And a constant theme throughout the discussion is really revolved around discipline. You know, discipline thought, define your strategy, know your business, set a pathway, um, and understand how the impacts of your operation. Um, um, happen through the environment. Discipline action, grow the right things, uh, leverage the right technology, manage your size appropriately, and discipline people. We just, we just talked about that with Jackson and get the right people, keep the right team, but really make the hard decisions when needed. Um, these are all signals to your counterparties that you can outlast temporary market cycles, be sustainable, um, and adjust if, if, if new market opportunities uh, persist. Uh, as you look to incorporate this framework, you know, I think it's important um, that you focus also on um, alignment and prioritization. Um, the strategy works if everyone is aligned and rowing in the right direction. You need to communicate and be transparent so everyone on your team is aware and working towards the same strategic vision you've set. And well, sometimes you want to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible, prioritizing a realistic pathway and investment time frame is crucial. And it is hard, and we're, we're struggling with that here at Farmer Act, but it is necessary. And, and talking about Farmer Mac, you know, what we want to leave you with today is everything that we've talked about is really concepts that we've engaged in at Farmer Mac. You know, being around for over 30 years, um, we never really engaged in a full-blown strategic plan until um, 2018, so two years ago. We were, we were you know, accepted in, in 1988. So um, 30 years into our first strategic plan, and it wasn't until last year that we really sat down, you know, Jackson, myself, some other senior leaders, and really mapped out our strategic vision. What did we want to be in two to five years? Let's chart the course. How are we going to get there? What did we need to invest in? And once we had that alignment on the strategic vision from our board of directors down to our employees, then we started to prepare and prioritize. What did investments do we need to make? What was the right team? Um, what was the right process improvements and the right financial budget to help us get to point A to point B um, as effectively and efficiently as possible? Now we're focusing on alignment and execution. Um, we're bringing the entire firm along and really focusing on the key pieces um, and the elements that we've identified to help effectuate our strategic vision. Um, what I found most challenging personally is figuring out how to appropriately prioritize um, certain elements of our strategic plan. You know, what pieces of the puzzle do you need to put in place because you can't all do them at once um, for this year to really set you up for next year and the following year to kind of um, meet the goals that you've outlined. And so currently Jackson and I had literally just started the process to refresh our strategic vision. Um, we're going to sit down with the senior team and really look at the market, what's gone well, what hasn't, what do we need to adjust? Um, and really going back to that component of, you know, adjusting annually and looking at your business. And so as we close today, um, we felt it was appropriate to share with you that Farmer Mac is, is doing what we can do to really try to become, go from a good to a great organization using the concepts that we've outlined today. You know, we have work to do, 
Um, it's not easy, but I'm encouraged by our organizational's pursuit and willingness in really trying to transition from, from good to great. So we appreciate all your time today and uh, look forward to questions that you may have. All right, thank you, Jackson and Zach, for that really insightful presentation. Uh, we do have some time for questions, and we've gotten a couple questions in from the audience so far. So uh, the first question is, what do you tell someone who understands that they need to spend time on analysis and strategic planning, but just really loves the hands-on work? Um, and then the second part of that question is, what about farmers who farm for the love of farming and not necessarily for uh, earning wealth and, and kind of generating that wealth? Absolutely. I'll touch on the first one and maybe I'll, I'll throw it over to Jackson on the second one. The, the first question in terms of, you know, focusing in, on the love of actually the execution and the farming, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And we see that, you know, quite a bit these days in terms of, you know, having that expertise and that vision and wanting to focus on the execution, not necessarily really the analysis part of it. Um, and, and really the feedback there is, is finding the right team. Um, if, if that's not your, 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 your key motivation or, or the key piece of the puzzle that you can bring to the table, then it's finding the right resources or team that can solidify that or help you uh, bridge that gap to really focus on strategy and financial analysis. And, and in many instances, Perfect example, we're working with some companies out in California or customers in California that to get to the next level, we've advised them to really get that expertise in-house, get a CPA, get a financial advisor, or leverage a consultant that really helps you prepare that analysis so you can focus on what you want to do, but you've also have that skill set in-house or leveraging a consultant to get you what you need to um, from a preparedness standpoint and an analysis standpoint. Yeah, I, I completely second that. I think getting the right people in place, and, and even if you're a one-person operation, there are consultants who can help supplement uh, and give you that extra piece, and they'll pay for themselves. I, I can promise uh, uh, people that, that uh, if you've got these other pieces and components in place, you'll be able to be more efficient, or you'll be able to uh, execute on that multi-year plan, and you won't have to spin your wheels quite as much. Um, so I think that even if you're a lean and mean organization, and I've worked for those uh, my whole career, uh, you you have to find ways to bring the things you need in to get to the next level. Uh, the, on the second question, which I think is a terrific one, um, as to the love of farming, and, you know, everybody has different goals. It gets down to what is your what is your strategy, your, and your plan is really to grow uh, and, and produce and sustain the business. You're not trying to become the uh, you know a 50,000 acre farm. You're not trying to integrate up or down the value chain. You just really love what you do and you want to do it every day. So I think that changes your strategy a little bit. It probably changes your end goal, but you still need to consider all of these pieces uh, to make sure that you're able to meet that goal. Because if, if demand moves from you and you're still, yeah, I, I hear you, I'm passionate about lots of things, but if you can't do them and make money, you'll have to do something else to make money. So making sure that you've got all these good pieces of, of special business in place, you don't necessarily have to invest a ton of technology. Maybe that's not the thing you want to spend more of your time in, but you have to consider it in order to make sure that you're meeting your goals of sustaining your family, your farm business. Uh, and, and if growth isn't the goal, that's fine. That doesn't have to be the goal, but you still want to succeed and meet your goal of sustaining the farm business for the next generation. Okay, thank you for that. And kind of along the same lines, um, how can we work to make ourselves a little bit more adaptable? Are there resources that you guys would refer people to um, that would help them kind of change that mindset and become that more adaptable, um, quick changing with the fast pace of changing the ag economy? Uh, well, so, so there's a lot of uh, research out there put out by your land-grant universities. So I, I point you to the fine folks at University of uh, Illinois, uh, but also a lot of the other land grants kind of along the I strip there. So in Iowa, and Indiana, you've got a lot of resources there. They're constantly doing research, test plots, all those kind of things. So connecting with uh, the university and doing some of the extension research there, I think is, a, is that can help a lot uh, with some of the technology pieces and keeping up with uh, some of the changes. USDA has a great uh, set of resources out there to research what are people growing. Uh, there's a, a wonderful tool called CropScape. Um, it's a little bit if you're if you're one of those people who uh, protects your uh, privacy a lot. This is this will terrify you to go look at CropScape. 
But you can actually drill down to uh, a plot level and see what was grown, the satellite uh, technology, to uh, inventory what are people growing. And you can look at it by year for the last, say, 25 years down to a very uh, a small level. And if you're, a far if you're a farmer, go check it out because it's pretty neat. You can see how accurate it is. Maybe it's not. Maybe let the you know, uh, USDA know that they're not getting it exactly right. But you can use that to say, hey, what are people around me growing? I hear people talk about growing uh, beans for you know, meat alternatives, protein alternatives. Is that something that I can use to supplement my soy crop? Uh, or uh, if soy is what I want to grow, uh, how, how close am I to multiple people to sell it to? So you can do a lot of that uh, research using USDA tools uh, to help supplement your understanding of the marketplace. I think it's also important to to leverage your your counterparties. I mean, the input providers that you work with, your customers, your your bank, your financial organization, um, and have conversations with them in terms of where you want to go and how you want to get there, and see what they're seeing in the market versus their other customer bases, who they're working with, where they see the market going, and some of the challenges they're seeing, and leverage some of that information that. Um, they've gleaned from some of their other counterparties or their other customers that might help you to become more adaptable. I mean, when you think about adaptiveness, it's it's really trying to focus on what you can do if the market changes to be adaptable to that market and getting more information in terms of what Jackson just you know, highlighted in um, you know, from a market standpoint, but also leveraging a lot of the, the counterparties and institutions you work alongside with to see what they're doing and how they're managing through the environment and being becoming more adaptable. I think that's a fantastic point. And maybe as part of that um, annual cycle, so if you're doing your business planning strategy and you're coming up on a loan that you need to renew, that's a great opportunity to sit across the table and not just tell information about your operation, but ask something of your lender too, to say, hey, what else is going on? What are you seeing out there? It's a great back and forth. It doesn't have to just be a farmer sitting there spilling uh, financial statements out. That's not the only, you can also use it as a two-way dialogue. That's a great, uh, fantastic point, Zach. Perfect. Um, so I have a kind of a question you're talking about kind of where we should go to look for some uh, interesting ways to keep ourselves adaptable. And some of that was more agronomic related. So how, where do you guys normally go as far as social media feeds or publications to keep up on uh, the current conditions in the ag economy? And uh, who, who are you guys kind of interested in or where should we be looking uh, to keep as up to date as possible? So I, I, again, I'll, po I'll point to my friends over at uh, University of Illinois. Farm Doc is a fantastic resource. You get a great email every day about something, especially if you're a regional producer. Uh, you're going to be able to get a lot of information out of the professors there from Langrate universities. And Farm Farm Doc does a great job of keeping. And you'll hear from I think economists throughout uh, the, the the AMP series uh, from University of Illinois. Uh, so I can't speak highly enough about the research centers that you would be able to sign up through. Um, uh, as a Purdue alum, I'll, I'll throw them out there as well. A lot of uh, agrometer research, uh, a lot of survey work that they're going to put out. Um, Iowa State has some great resources. So if you're in the hog side or uh, livestock side, they, they monitor profitability levels and prices and costs. Um, I also follow a lot of folks on social media. I'm on um, uh, Twitter as well, at Jackson Takis, so feel free to connect with me. I'll share stuff uh, periodically through social media, and there are a lot of uh, producers out there. Also, like Rabobank has a great research team. They share a lot of information uh, publicly. It's also have a paid service, um, so they'll probably, if you click on some of their stuff, they'll say, here's your free uh, section now, go buy the rest. Um, but there's a lot of really fantastic research that uh, they put out there. Um, USDA also every day they have something that's coming out, some research piece, uh, some market uh, piece. They have uh, uh, agricultural uh, market service puts out uh, prices in different regions for all sorts of different commodities. Uh, so for soy, I mean, they, they've got different touch points in Illinois. Um, so if you're curious what kind of prices you're getting and you want to compare that to other market prices, it's a wonderful uh, resource as well. Uh, there's no shortage of people talking about uh, agriculture right now out there in the, in the media space. Uh, so connect with me on Twitter. I'm happily, happy to share some of the folks that I follow uh, with you on there. And, and the only thing I would say, because this is definitely Jackson's wheelhouse in terms of research and um, the, the economics behind it is, you know, the farm credit system is over $350 billion in, oh, yeah. in and they're very regionalized. So depending where you are, you know, I would leverage your, your farm credit system institution. A lot of them are now putting out research specific to the territories they cover. 
and the sectors and commodities that are in that. And, you know, I came from CoBank, so they do a lot of rural infrastructure as well as agribusiness, but, you know, break it down to dairy, protein, et cetera. Um, Compier has some, um, and I know they're a great sponsor uh, of this um, presentation. So I would leverage some of those regionalized um, associations to see what research they provide. And if they don't publicly disclose it, maybe reach out and see if they have anything that I think they'd be happy to give you in terms of some of the analytics they're looking at from the specific commodities and, and what's going on in the market perspective. That's great. Uh, I'll, let me just tack on one thing there uh, that Jack touched on um, is reach out. I know sometimes, and it's hard for me to do too sometimes, is I don't want to bother somebody or I, I, you know, I don't want to uh, impose on somebody and ask for something. But we are thrilled. If I get an email from a producer out there, it's like, hey, I, I noticed, I uh, heard you speak here. Or I saw this thing that you published. Can you, t can you tell me about this? I always respond to those things. So you'd be surprised um, if you reached out to a name on a report or if you uh, just cold called uh, someone at one of, you know, at CoBank or Compeer or Farmer Mac. Uh, if you cold called, you know, anybody that you think would be an expert in the field, you might be surprised who you get on the phone. Uh, and so I would encourage everyone to just be bold. Sometimes if you want to know something, just call the person you're trying to get or send them an email and you'd be surprised how often you get a response. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. I just have uh, one kind of quick last question. Um, I know this isn't specifically you guys' wheelhouse, but what kind of items would you encourage potential clients to have prepared? Um, when they are going to meet with their loan officers, uh, either for a potential new loan or uh, maybe just renewal. So just a few highlighted items, nothing too uh, specific, but what are what would be on your mind? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And, and, and just at a high level, I mean, it's really just uh, the, the preparation, right? Have everything prepared. Um, the financial analysis is a very key component. And depending where you are, tax returns not might not be the best um, form of financial analysis that a bank would want to see. So, so having more of a financial statement, assessment of your business, and, and projections. And if you come to the table with, you know, some historical performance in a realistic projection, that's a very, very solid foundation to start with. And if you layer on some of the key concepts that we talked about today in terms of, hey, here's where I want to go, here's my vision, and this is what I want to do to get there, you're, I think you'll be surprised that um, a lot of these organizations that are very relationship focused we are going to be more than happy to work with you to find and fill what you need to do um, from a vision perspective. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, just uh, want to send a final thank you to our sponsor for the session, Compure Financial. And thank you to all our AMP partners, Illinois FBFM. Uh, the University of Illinois Farm Doc team, and also the Illinois Soybean Association Checkoff Program. Um, the recording of this presentation will be posted on the ISA webinar archive, uh, which is on our YouTube channel as well, and sent to all attendees via an email uh, once per week. So please take a few minutes at the conclusion of our webinar to just answer a brief survey. Uh, your feedback will help us to improve these offerings into the future. And we hope to see you here uh, back next week for another two AMP webinar uh, summer series. And our sessions begin at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. on July 15th. And you can find more information about those webinars at ilsoyadvisor.com. Thank you again for attending and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.